have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis, uh, the first chapter. And uh, we're going to get there in just a minute here. But as we're turning there, I want you to think about something. I'm going to throw a phrase out uh, because it's, it, it's important. Uh, you probably hear it. Maybe Rick has heard it. Rick has said it from the pulpit many times. And maybe you have heard it. But I'm just going to say this. What is your worldview? Has anybody ever heard of a phrase like that? Has anybody ever asked you, what's your worldview? Okay. Anybody? You, has anybody ever heard that phrase before? Okay. Uh, I think we have. It's becoming more and more popular every single day. And people want to know, what's, what's your worldview? What, what is it that you really, really believe in? And they want to know those things. As a matter of fact, let me just share with you the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, fourth edition from 2000 says this, worldview, noun. The overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world. A collection of beliefs about life and the universe held by an individual or a group. And then it goes on to say, a person's worldview, whether it be a Christian, humanist, or whatever, is a personal insight about meaning and reality. It is how a person interprets through his own eyes a personal belief about the world, a person's uh, world view tries to give reasons for how the facts of reality relate and tie together. It is the summation of these facts that provide the big picture into which the daily events of a person's life should fit. Part of your world view is something like this. Uh, where did I come from? Has anybody ever asked that question before? Maybe in your quiet moments, you probably asked yourself, you know, who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What am I doing here? And where am I going? Let's be honest. Has anybody ever asked any of those questions secretly or maybe to your spouse? Raise your hand if you're honest. Okay, this group over here is not honest. You've, you know what? Since you've asked those questions and you probably know the answers, I'm just going to speak to these guys right over here, okay? No, but we've all asked those questions. And so... Part of our worldview is trying to figure out uh, the answer to those questions. In an article by Clyde F. Oshio, May 2nd, 2005, uh, the article was, What is your worldview? He says, Of greatest immediate concern is the worldview clash between two major camps. There's the biblical worldview and the non-biblical worldview. There's only two. The opening verse of the Bible sets forth the first and most important facts as the foundation for the development of worldview, of a worldview. In this case, it is the basis for a biblical worldview. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Within this short verse are several profound statements that must be at the core of every biblical worldview. First, it states that since God created the heaven and the earth, he existed prior to that creation. And the verse only speaks of one God. Second, the universe had a beginning, and that beginning was the creation of God. And third, that since God created the heaven and the earth, he must be either or both superior to and sovereign over all of creation. Okay? Now, real quick, I have a short video that I want to show you uh, to kind of sum up what a worldview is. And uh, just watch it and see what you come up with, okay? Well, we need some sound. Not have doubts. You're not a very spiritual person, are you? How dare you question God? You ask too many questions. You must not be saved. Is it wrong to doubt the Bible? Well... What is doubt? It's your mind trying to learn, adjusting its grip on truth. As you move through life, some of your ideas about reality become more firmly positioned in your mind, while others become less certain. These need to be examined from time to time. If they're reaffirmed, they're inserted back into your belief system. If not, they're thrown away and replaced with a new, updated understanding. This ongoing process of establishing or revising enables you to keep growing in your understanding of reality. But it requires that you ask good questions and diligently seek answers. 
But is it okay to question the Bible? According to the Christian worldview, God has revealed himself through the Bible and through the natural world. Because God is a rational mind, the natural world is structured in a way that's accessible to rational minds. Thus, humans created in his image, having rational minds, can approach the natural world rationally, asking good questions and searching for answers. In the same way also, the Bible, being an expression of God's mind, is structured in a way that makes it accessible to our minds. So, humans can approach the Bible rationally, asking good questions and searching for reasonable answers. But if we do question the Bible, will it hold up or not? Well, let's take an example. Does archaeological evidence support the Bible? It's a good question. It would be a real problem if none of the people or places in the Bible ever existed. The fact is, over the last 200 years, archaeologists have uncovered a vast amount of evidence confirming the existence of people mentioned in the Bible. They've also located all the major biblical cities and geographical features in the Bible. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed along with the very greatest historians. There can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of the Old Testament tradition. So there's our answer. Archaeological evidence supports the historical reliability of the Bible. By asking honest questions and looking for answers, we gain confidence in the Bible. The problem's not asking questions. The problem is not asking questions. Because if you don't have questions, you can't find answers. So raise your doubts, ask good questions, search for answers, and grow in your understanding and confidence in God's Word. Okay, I have to be honest with you, that actually wasn't the video I was going to show you. <laughs> but I thought, wow, that's really good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. We had it up there and it looked really good. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, you have to ask a lot of questions uh, when it comes to God's Word. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Rick, you want to come finish this? He just keeps smiling back there, and I love the guy, so he's very contagious. Anyway, so uh, let me just say this, going back to our, our worldview. We have to have a proper biblical worldview, right? Uh, now, I don't know. There's a lot of people in here. I don't know if you believe in God's Word or not. I would assume that, and, and I, you know what, I really shouldn't assume, but m probably the majority of in he people in here believe that God's Word is actually from God, right? Maybe there was a time that you didn't believe it was, and maybe there was a time that you wanted to find out for yourself. I know I was there personally. I didn't know anything about God's Word, and I had to ask questions myself, going back to the video, you know, and ask the right questions. So to sum up a worldview is this. It is your belief system. What do you believe in? Is, is it is, is a, a proper biblical worldview or is it not? And so the way that I would look at it is like this. When we look at something in the Bible, we have to look at it through, you know, here's, here's my glasses. You know, put it on, I could see Mark, you know, back there, you know, and, and I could see Tony. Without it, you know, it's kind of blurry. Uh, but uh, what we have to do is when we look at the Bible is, is to look at it through the proper lens of God's Word, okay? Anything that, that you hear, is it from God's word or not? Does that make sense? Okay, so you're all with me on that. <laughs> That's a great video. Anyway, um, so, so see, here the Bible presents a great problem to me and to probably to most of all of mankind. Do we believe that this book is actually from God or not? Uh, do we endorse it or do we ignore it? Do we follow it or do we fight it? It is either a light that guides us or a lie that beguiles us. It either contains answers and directions and deceptions. Uh, is the Bible the product of God or is it the product of man? Because there's two camps.
okay? Uh, so let me tell you a, a little bit about how this has shaped my worldview. Since becoming a Christian, uh, you know, and looking back at my life, at one time, I had different views about life, okay? Uh, let me tell you some of those, okay? Uh, when my wife and I first got married, I, uh, there was one time that we had a conversation about, you know, if, if she was pregnant and the child was not healthy, what would you do with the child? Okay, at one time, I believed, just abort, abort it, get rid of it, right? But then I became a Christian and I figured out how beautiful life is uh, from God. And so then my, my worldview changed uh, to believe that life was a gift from God and that no matter what that life is born, uh, I, would tre- I would treasure it and cherish it. Do you see what I'm saying? Because at one time, we think a, a certain way. And, and see, that's the way it is a, a lot of times in our life because man tells you believe in one way and a lot of times we believe that way until we come to God's word and he helps us to open up our eyes and see things differently. So we want to have this proper uh, worldview, this, this, this biblical worldview. Here's what I believe. I believe that God's word is inspired word and therefore it is inherent. Let me just share a scripture with you uh, from 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every, every good work. That word inspired is from the Greek word that literally means that God breathed. So the way that I look at the scriptures is that God has breathed these words. And it's as if he's just speaking to us, right? Is everybody on board with that? He's breathed these words and we can understand it. But there's a lot of people that are skeptics and don't believe that these are from God themselves. But the writers prove otherwise that they are, okay? The Bible writers were not like news reporters giving their personal interpretation of events uh, they, they eyewitnessed but were divinely guided. Let me share another scripture with you from 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. It says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God worked together with these men who he had inspired to write down these words. And that's what you have in your hands uh, if you have your Bible. Another scripture is this. Um, from uh, 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse 13, it says, We constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but from what it really is, the word of God. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21 says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Do you have any questions so far? So God used these, these men and to write God's word, okay? I believe the word is from God, okay? Uh, I also believe that the word of God is objective truth. I believe it's absolute truth, not subjective truth. Does everybody know the difference between objective and subjective truth? Subjective truth means the truth is subject to the holder of the truth. And that is going on everywhere, isn't it? There are so many people say, well, you know, that's your truth and that's my truth and it doesn't matter. And there's so much out there. What do you believe? Right? You know, as I was studying for this, I have to be honest with you. um, I didn't know a whole lot about evolution. And I didn't know a whole lot about, uh, you know, some of the, the things that uh, Rick wanted me to study about. Uh, but like me, I, I, want, I, I want to accept the challenge and I want to learn more and more. As I was studying for this, I was thinking, there's so much information on the other side. And there's the Bible. 
And as I've always looked at it, Satan is kind of like this, this, this guy that likes to muddy the water and make people doubt God's word. And so man is over there and he has so much information. It's like, what do you believe? Some of it's true. Some of it's not true. Some of it's just opinion. Some of it's just, you know, theory. Some of it's just assumption. I mean, it's just like, it's almost mind boggling. And then you have to go back to God's word to find out what the truth is. At least that's where I was at. And so that's my worldview. Anything I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at through the lens of the Bible. Okay? Through God's word. Which I would challenge you that if God's word is not a priority in your life, make it a priority in your life. Get into it. Study it. Uh, you know, you have classes here. Uh, Rick's a great teacher. Right? Isn't it? Yes. Uh, you know, I watch some of his videos, and I'm like, the guy knows the Word of God, and he wants to teach you the truth. Clyde teaches you the truth, and that's the one thing about this church is they want to take a stand on the truth of God's Word. It has always been that way, uh, which is pretty awesome. So anyway, um, so, so where am I? Let me just say this. Okay, Jesus claimed to be objective truth because he said this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Remember that in John 14? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And every time I look at that verse, here's what I think of. I need to lay down the way that I think is the way for his way. Right? And I need to lay down uh, what I think is truth for his truth. And I need to lay down my life for his life. But he says, and this is absolute, he, he's making this claim here that he is absolute truth. And he also makes a clear and blunt claim also in John the 17th chapter in verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And I also believe that God cannot lie. Hebrews 6, chapter, verse 18 tells us that. So if the Bible is found false or even misleading in incidental facts, then the book as a whole cannot be trusted. Would you agree with that statement? I mean, if there's even a, a slight misleading in just incidental facts, guess what? You can't trust it. I got a question for you. What if you went to the end of your life and, and you study this book, and, and, and you read it, and you live it out by your faith, and you come to the end of your life, and you find out that it isn't true. Okay? Wouldn't you be disappointed? Man, I would be so mad <laughs> and so upset. Okay? But God's Word tells us it is truth. And that's what I want to say to you guys, is that God's word is truth. There's two camps. You're either going to believe a fallible man or infallible God. Okay, and we know that man makes mistakes over and over and over and over again, right? All you have to do is look at yourself. Has there ever been a thing where you thought was true and come to find out you knew it was just totally wrong? Anybody? Absolutely. Uh, and so that's where we're at. Okay. So anyway, any, any thoughts, any, any, any questions? They said, uh, to fill up the hour with, uh, ask, by asking questions. So <laughs> are you all on board with what I'm saying here? Okay. So let's go back to, so you know where I, where I stand. So let me ask you this. Does it really matter if we believe, uh, in the literal Genesis uh, creation account. We all would agree that the teaching of evolution has made significant inroads in the beliefs of common man. True? I have a, I have a guy back in my congregation who, who is a, a science teacher. As a matter of fact, he taught in the, uh, the schools there at Council Bluffs, and uh, he went to school, got his PhD in science and, and uh, uh, some other things. Uh, but I was talking to him one day, and he said, I just had to get out of the school system here he's a Christian man and he believes in God and he believes in the creation and he believes in Jesus Christ and, 
And here they were making him teach things that, that he didn't believe, such as evolution. And so we were talking, and he said, you know what? I had to get out of there because even in the textbooks, also those, some of the things that they have been teaching in our schools have been repudiated uh, that weren't true, and they found out were lies. They still teach those lies, right? And it's like, wow. And so he got out, and now he's... Uh, he's um, He's at the Heartland Christian School, and he's teaching creation, and he's also a science teacher, but he's also a principal there himself. But his wife is still in the school system. And so you and I know that, that evolution is, is, uh, has been indoctrinating our kids uh, for so long. And as I was studying this, I wish I would have paid attention, more attention to science when I was in school. Okay? It wasn't one of my favorite subjects. Uh, to be honest with you, but I wish I did, and I appreciate it more and more when I start studying more and more. But anyway, going back to Genesis, it says this in Genesis, the first chapter in verses one and, and two, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I have an elder that's uh, back in my congregation. His name is Larry Allen. Uh, he's a great guy. It has, uh, I mean, he just loves the Word of God, and, and uh, he has these, these eyes that just accept you very much. But here's what he said to me once, and, and you hear him say it over and over again. He said this, if you can believe in the beginning God, if you could just believe that statement, then everything else you'll believe, okay, if you believe in that. So the very first verse, verse of the Bible is either true or false. If false, then truth uh, would have to be this. Something accidentally came from nothing. Something eternal accidentally brought life and order. But something has never come from nothing. Right? Okay. Um, that's the basis for the cosmological argument for God's existence. And I know that, Rick, you've talked about that before, Right? or somebody has, um, um, it's the universe is an effect, it, its existence is undeniable, which demands an adequate and sustaining first cause. Something exists. Something cannot produce nothing. Has anybody ever seen that happen before? No. Therefore, something or someone must have caused it. The universe is either self-caused, that's impossible, it would have to exist before it existed to cause itself. The universe is uncaused. That's not possible unless it's eternal and infinite or caused by another. So there must be a first uncaused cause which started it all. And to say that, somebody created this. Right? Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, if somebody has their Bible, turn to Psalm 19, verse 1. Now let's just read that. Psalm 19, verse 1. Somebody want to do that? Let's, and then somebody read uh, Romans, the first chapter, verse 20. Somebody else have that verse? Somebody like to do that? Psalm 19, 1. Just, just read it. The heavens declare the glory of God. Okay. And so we're looking at it through our world vision, our biblical view. As we're looking at this and we say, hey, God created the heavens, right? Uh, they declare his glory. Now, I know it's very hard for you to see his glory here. But you know why? Because we have so much light pollution, right? But have you ever gone to a place like Yellowstone National Park or anything like that and been out in the evening time and seen all the wonderful stars? It's breathtaking, isn't it? And it points to a creator, to tell you a short story, but Lisa uh, went on vacation with us to Yellowstone National Park, and we were actually coming back from Yellowstone National Park, and we were traveling through South Dakota. Uh, we were almost on empty. Remember, we were trying to get a gas station, but it's late at night, and there's no gas stations uh, open uh, in South Dakota late at night. And I remember we were in this van, and Lisa was looking outside, and these are the words that she said. She said, wow, those are a lot of, cl those are a lot of clouds out there. And I said, Lisa, those are not clouds. Those are stars. Remember that? And we got the van, and we went out, and I said, look at all these stars. There were so many of them. Guess what? It looked like clouds. 
formations. And I said, do they declare the glory of God? And they do. Okay. So th- the next one is, uh, so we know that there's a creator behind this. Uh, Romans 1.20 says this. Anybody who has that real quick? Yes, sir. So since the beginning of the world, his invisible attributes have been clearly seen. You know what those invisible attributes are? It's the things that you can see, right? Okay, that's called general revelation. Okay, everywhere you go, you see creation. Today, uh, it was a rainstorm. Okay, I know some of you were like, oh my goodness, it's raining. Okay, and you were blaming on me, okay, because it was God that was behind it. I don't have a prayer life like that. <laughs> if I do, you better watch out. But anyway, um, so the rain shows us things. And so that is, that's a general revelation. All these things are around to show you that God exists, right? Here's the key, folks. You're the pinnacle of God's creation. Here's what bothers me sometimes. We'll go out into the mountains and we'll go, oh my goodness, how beautiful are the mountains? And if you've ever been to Yellowstone or the Tetons or anything like that or, or Colorado or the Los Hills of Council Bluffs where you can ski, they're real small. You look at them and it's like, oh my goodness, God, you're an amazing creator. It's beautiful that you can create that. And yet, All you have to do is look at yourself and look at the people around you and go, oh my goodness, there's the pinnacle of God's creation is you. That's what I was trying to say Sunday is that you are so valuable to God that you're the pinnacle of his creation. So the next time you look at each other, I love what Gary Smalley says. (laughs) Ah! Can everybody do that? Uh, Why don't you look at the person next to you and go, ah! I can't believe I'm in the presence of you. Come on, finish it. Oh, come on. You, got, you see, you, can, you don't even think that you guys are the pinnacle of God's creation. So let's try it again. Look at each other and say, oh, I can't believe I'm in the presence of you. Rick, they have some work to do, okay? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so, so there's general revelation all around for you to see. God has given us a specific revelation. That is his word. And that doesn't change. There are some people who believe that it changes, but it does not change. What he's given us is all that we need that pertains to life and godliness, okay? Uh, So yeah, um, what was that? The cosmological argument existence for God. There's the teleological argument for God's existence. The design, order, and complexity of the universe point to a rational, intelligent, purposeful creator who is the first cause of it all. Okay, and I know this is probably used over and over again, but a a watch demands a watchmaker, right? A car demands a car maker. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so design and order implies a designer. We see design everywhere. Since we see design, there must be a designer. All you have to look is is some basic things. You know, how about, you know, winter, summer, fall, uh, spring? It happens all the time, right? The leaves come, they grow. Uh, They're in the summertime. Fall comes. They fall off. Winter comes. It gets really, really cold. Guess what happens? Spring comes back around again. Leaves start to blossom. Trees start to blossom. And boom, there it is again. It's designed that way. Over and over and over again. It never changes. Right? So we have a designer. Um, You can read this later, moving right along. Job 38 and 39 talks about this, especially Job 38, 1 through 7. You can write that down. And then there's also another argument for God's existence, and that's the anthropological argument. You know, that's our personality and our intelligence and our will and our emotions and where they, our moral nature we have. It must reflect the creator who himself is personal and moral. The bottom line is this, uh, is, the cre- is that the creation reflects the creator. 
Does that make sense? God is a moral God. He's intelligent. You know, that's one thing I think that evolution can't, uh, you know, ever answer is that where does, where does the moral code come from? Where do these laws come from? Okay. Uh, they come from our creator because the creation reflects the creator. Uh, to, someone wants to read uh, Romans, the second chapter, verse 15 and 19. And then if somebody wants to read Psalm 8, 3 through 6. Okay. Who's got Romans 2, 15 and 19? Don't be shy. Okay. Romans 2, 15 and 19. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then who has Psalm 8, 3, and 3 through 6? Bob, did you have that? Okay, you had Romans. Psalm 8, 3 through 6. Someone would like to read that? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so, you know, we all have a conscience, right? Why do we have stuff like that? Unless your conscience is very seared, right? Uh, have you ever done something wrong in your conscience and you have this guilt? Where does that come from? You see what I'm saying? You see, because we want to be morally right because our creator is morally right. It makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, and then there's the ontological argument for God's existence. Almost every person has the idea in his mind of a perfect being, which, I, which, which idea had to come outside of a man from the perfect being who is the perfect cause of it all. The nature of man's concept of God demands his existence. And I think that's one of the reasons why man is searching, searching, because we want to know, like we said, where do we come from? Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? You all, ask, remember I asked you that question. You know, have you ever asked those questions? And we all have. You know what? That's built inside of us. Our creator made us that way. Right? Uh, Genesis 3, 5 says that we were created in his image. Um, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, if somebody wants to turn there. Isaiah uh, 55, uh, verses 8 and 9. Uh, Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 14, 1. And then Deuteronomy 32, 4. Who has Isaiah 55, 8 through 9? Someone over here? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, very good. Psalm 14, 1. Yes, Bob. Okay. Uh, Tony, you have, who has uh, Deuteronomy 32, 4? Somebody? Yes. Yes, he's that way. And so he demands that we be that way too. his creation, right? But there's a lot of people that just don't want to believe that. Okay, that's one of the reasons why we have so much corruption in the world because people are doing things that are right in their own eyes. Okay, remember what we said at the beginning. A biblical worldview is essential and is important to compare what God's word says with what man teaches.